All right, so uh, in the United States, before uh, any of the vaccines actually came out, we knew uh, from public polling that uptake was likely to be a challenge um, for various reasons. Uh, so while developing a COVID-19 vaccine was uh, obviously, you know, a scientific miracle, especially in the time uh, that we were able to do it, uh, doing that was really only half the battle. So uh, over the last like 10, 15 years, uh, behavioral insight teams uh, have spread across the globe, uh, with many of them uh, being embedded in governments um, and helping to advise policy uh, when relevant. And uh, when vaccines first came out, uh, one of the uh, behavioral insights that really caught on and became uh, trendy were vaccine lotteries. Uh, and while uh, there was some evidence that vaccine lotteries um, could maybe increase vaccine uptake, uh, because there had been studies done that showed uh, that lotteries could increase uptake of other uh, healthcare related behaviors, uh, the study with the largest sample that had ever been conducted was about 15,000 participants. Uh, and so there was a real question uh, when the Ohio uh, vaccine lottery came out about if this could actually work at this scale. Uh, but before anyone could actually uh, do anything about that um, or really ask that question and find out, uh, it really started to spread across uh, uh, the states in the United States. And so uh, at Behavior Change for Good, uh, we thought we'd run our own uh, vaccine lottery to see, you know, does any of this actually work? And is it worth all the public resources that are being invested? Uh, and so that kind of uh, brings me to the first of three studies that I'm going to discuss uh, today. Uh, so one of the problems with uh, running a geographic-based um, intervention is that you don't really have a, a real control group uh, because uh, we ran our vaccine lottery in the city of Philadelphia. However, uh, there's no place else in the entire world like the city of Philadelphia. Uh, therefore, we can't just run an intervention in the city and then compare it to something else. Um, and have it truly be, you know, an experiment. Um, so we decided to, in addition to running the vaccine lottery, kind of embed an experiment inside of it. And the experiment that we embedded was to see if whether or not uh, higher odds um, matter. Uh, so uh, we had a total of three drawings uh, for the lottery over uh, six weeks. And we had, you know, different prizes, you know, the highest being 50,000, the lowest being 1,000. And uh, we randomly selected one zip code out of the city uh, for each drawing to receive higher odds. And so they had 50 to 100 times the odds of the rest of the city to see if they could, um, uh, if that would motivate more people to get vaccinated. And what we found uh, was that it didn't work. Uh, we, and we are very confident in the robustness of the experiment that higher odds do not increase vaccination uptake. Uh, now, when it comes to whether or not the actual vaccine lottery overall increased vaccine uptake, our results were more equivocal, um, which again goes to just kind of the nature of running a geographic-based intervention. However, um, some of our colleagues decided to essentially take uh, our data and then the data from every other vaccine lottery conducted in the United States, um, you know, ran a meta-analysis and found uh, that lotteries don't really um, seem to boost COVID-19 vaccination rates uh, whatsoever and therefore are not a good policy uh, worthy of public investment. Uh, now, ideally, um, policy uh, advice uh, should be based on field experiments. Um, however, uh, running field experiments require huge fixed costs and they take a lot of time. And even when we have field studies to look at, looking at effect sizes across studies uh, requires apples to oranges comparisons, even when you're looking at kind of the same idea tested, because people are testing it in uh, not just different contexts, but they're measuring kind of their outcome variable in different ways that could lead to, you know, very different effects. Um, and this is, you know, kind of a problem with the replication crisis that has kind of gripped the social science field uh, in recent years, uh, because it's not always clear uh, which behavioral insights are robust, and therefore it's, you know, you don't really know what to advise policymakers to implement. Um, and there's also uh, kind of the file drill problem that 
Uh, people run lots of experiments, uh, but when there are null results, historically, it is very hard to publish them, and therefore, they don't get published, and people don't know whether or not something actually works. Uh, so, you know, kind of what's the solution to this? Uh, so at, the, uh, at Behavior Change for Good, our kind of bread and butter approach is what we call the mega study, which is a very large field experiment in which smaller sub-experiments are run uh, at the same time and using the same dependent variable so we can actually make apples to apples comparisons between different interventions. Uh, and kind of the benefits of this approach is one, comparability. Uh, two, uh, it lowers fixed costs uh, because there's a single entity, uh, you know, organizing and running the study. And therefore, there's a lot of low marginal costs uh, for scientists that are testing out their various ideas. Uh, it reduces risk of learning nothing um, from uh, an expensive field experiment. Uh, because no matter what, um, if, you know, some of the interventions aren't going to be uh, significant, but they'll still be published uh, along with all the, uh, you know, successful interventions. Uh, it can also be run as kind of an interdisciplinary tournament where you uh, gather ideas from all the different and various fields that are studying an idea, such as vaccinations, uh, so that you are, you know, really testing um, all the different approaches, um, you know, that people can come up with. Uh, it also allows us to kind of behavioral, um, for behavioral phenotyping, so figuring out uh, not just, you know, what works, but what works for who. Um, and lastly, like it, it accelerates the pace of scientific discovery because instead of taking five, 10 or more years uh, to research a uh, host of ideas, we're able to do it in a year or two. And uh, that brings me uh, to uh, my second uh, uh, article that I'm gonna discuss, uh, which is a uh, vaccine uptake mega study that we ran before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we partnered with uh, uh, Walmart Pharmacies, which is one of the largest pharmacy chains in the United States. Uh, and we targeted flu shots uh, because at its max in the United States, um, flu vaccination in a single season has reached about 50%, which is uh, uh, far below uh, the recommended level for herd immunity. Uh, our customers um, in this study were, uh, or our uh, participants, were customers who had previously received a flu shot at Walmart during the previous flu season. Um, and, uh, this was about a 690,000 person sample, um, majority ma uh, female, and then, uh, you know, mostly older. Uh, and we tested, uh, 22 different, uh, text-based, um, reminder nudges, uh, and a sample of them would be, uh, commit to getting a flu shot, uh, get a shot to protect your family and friends, uh, more, uh, Americans are getting a flu shot than in the past, a shot is waiting for you, and people who get the flu shot are healthier, wealthier, and better educated. Uh, so did we increase vaccinations? And what we found uh, was that all of our interventions did uh, compared to the business as usual holdout control of not sending any messages. Uh, so reminders work. Um, however, our top performer uh, was two texts, um, an initial and then one sent three days later. Uh, that emphasized uh, that a vaccine was waiting for you, uh, which implies a sense of ownership uh, to the person receiving it and potentially could even invoke a sense of loss uh, if the person doesn't go and uh, get the vaccine because it's something that's already theirs. And so if they forego it, they're losing out on something. And so uh, from this study, uh, some of the key takeaways we took were that ownership language reliably improved performance of vaccine reminders. Uh, multiple reminders uh, outperformed single reminders. Uh, so nagging uh, patients helps. Um, we found that informal uh, and interactive texts uh, were less effective, um, especially ones, uh, one of the texts we tried was uh, making jokes uh, and that did, uh, did not work very well. And so when COVID happened, uh, we were wondering to ourselves, uh, okay, this works for flu shots, uh, but would it actually work uh, for you know, COVID-19 vaccination uptake? Uh, and some uh, uh, you know, places were already starting to adopt this language, including the city of New York, in some of their reminder text messages. So some colleagues um, conducted some studies and found that yes, indeed, uh, this does uh, extend to COVID-19 vaccination uh, take up. 
So we then started to wonder, okay, uh, reminders work. Uh, they work for flu. They work for COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, especially in, um, you know, 2021, 2022, uh, you know, when the boosters uh, were coming out, uh, is there something we could kind of add on top of this language uh, to improve it, to have a bigger impact and increase um, vaccination uptake even more? Um, and so that brings me uh, to my third study, uh, which is uh, it's currently under review at Nature. Uh, so these results are, are fresh-ish. Um, so uh, one of the, uh, one of the things that was a, a like a a big item of discussion uh, in the United States um, and in other places, uh, as we heard earlier today, um, was access to vaccinations. Um, can people actually get, um, you know, to where uh, vaccines are? Um, and so what we were wondering is, you know, do free rides to and from the pharmacy for a vaccination appointment add value? Um, and we thought this mattered because small transaction costs uh, can matter a lot and they can be the determinant of whether or not someone, you know, um, uptakes the behavior. Uh, and vaccine, as I said, ac uh, accessibility had been widely discussed challenge. And there was research that showed clearly that those who live uh, further from vaccination sites are less likely to get vaccinated. Now we decided to uh, kind of uh, approach this problem uh, by offering free rides uh, because in uh, mid to late 2021, uh, the Biden administration uh, partnered with Lyft and Uber to uh, invest a lot of money offering free rides and in our discussions uh, with other entities, you know, this was uh, a, a topic that was really in interested um, to a lot of uh, individual organizations and one that a lot of them were considering investing in. Uh, so uh, to run this mega study, we partnered uh, with what I will call the pharmacy. It is a, a different, um, not Walmart, uh, but a different uh, pharmacy in the United States, one of the largest ones. Uh, I tell you their name, but uh, I changed one of the slides without them seeing it, so I'm being a little extra careful. Uh, and so in this uh, study, uh, we randomly assigned about 3.6 million patients uh, to one of nine uh, experimental conditions. Um, and uh, due to uh, kind of budget constraints, uh, we could you know, only offer so many free rides. Uh, the free ride condition only had about 50,000 uh, patients in it, whereas all the other conditions had about 492,000. Um, and our sample is about 40% male, um, you know, average age of 47. Uh, and because we were offering free rides uh, through Lyft, uh, we had to make sure that anyone we offered a free ride uh, to could actually use the free ride. Uh, and so we focused um, our uh, residents on the 65 largest uh, metropolitan areas in uh, the United States. So all of the patients are living predominantly in urban or suburban environments. Um, and uh, our focus was whether or not uh, in the first 30 days after receiving a text message, uh, patients, uh, you know, got the COVID-19 bivalent booster and uh, conditions were determined about whether or not uh, what text message they received starting on November 3rd, 2022. And uh, some of the texts that we tested was uh, we wanted to test again kind of our simple waiting for you language so that we could see if any of these actually um, that are adding on top of it, outperformed it. Uh, we had our free lift ride. Um, we were informing patients uh, that they lived in a high COVID uh, transmission county uh, and uh, providing resources to combat misinformation. Uh, so did we increase uh, booster rates? Uh, and yes, uh, we, uh, in all of our conditions, um, again, you know, outperformed the uh, holdout control condition However, uh, offering free rides adds no additional value uh, to, um, you know, just kind of our standard bread and butter, uh, you know, reminder waiting for you language. Uh, what did, uh, what was some of our top performers uh, was uh, suggesting a personalized plan. Uh, so we, uh, when we texted folks, we recommended that they uh, go to the same pharmacy that they got their last vaccine at, same pharmacy location, and at on the same day of the week and time as their last vaccine. Uh, and the idea here is that it worked last time for them, this uh, pharmacy location, day of the week and time. So perhaps it'll work again. Um, and then our other two top performers, uh, 
the first one, um, uh, we said uh, you're in a uh, county with high transmission rates. The county's in the top, you know, X percent in the United States. You know, come and get your COVID booster. And then, uh, you know, the third top performer uh, was addressed from their local pharmacy team was recommending it to them. And so these three top performers we found were adding levels of uh, personalization uh, to the patients. And one of the other things we tested uh, was sending them uh, a link to some uh, CDC uh, information, kind of combating, uh, you know, misinformation uh, and providing some facts about the COVID-19 vaccine. However, uh, we found that this didn't add any additional value um, on top of just our standard waiting for you language. Uh, however, um, one of our funders, the Mercury Project, there's, uh, they're funding a number of other teams that are kind of digging into ways uh, to uh, dispel and combat uh, misinformation and disinformation. So hopefully, uh, you know, some of that research will uh, provide some insights. Uh, so uh, kind of going back to our, our main focus, which was uh, do free rides provide, uh, you, know, uh, you know, can they boost anything? Additionally, when we realized that they didn't, uh, we wondered to ourselves, uh, were we completely off base for even thinking this to begin with. Um, and so we decided to conduct a, uh, a prediction study, uh, forecasting study uh, with both uh, experts. So 163 uh, PhD behavioral scientists and then lay people, um, about 199 folks uh, recruited on Prolific. And we asked them uh, kind of, uh, as you can see on, is that the, oh, there we go. Uh, on the x-axis, um, could they for, you know, what, what did they think the predicted, um, you know, uh, effect increase in the vaccination rate would be um, for the, uh, all the different interventions? And then on the y-axis, we have um, kind of what the actual uh, intervention effect was. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the uh, lay people um, with the black dots, um, you know, vastly, uh, overestimated uh, the effect size compared to the experts, which are the gray X's. Um, uh, but even the experts uh, were wildly um, optimistic about the effect of uh, what these interventions could do, uh, which kind of underlies the importance of uh, conducting field experiments um, and, you know, having actual real uh, robust evidence uh, to inform policy. Uh, but in both uh, the the lay people and the experts, they all uh, predicted that the uh, providing free lift rides would uh, be the top performer and be the top performer by a significant margin. Uh, so after conducting this, we felt more comfortable in kind of our initial assumption of looking into whether or not this would actually be uh, a uh, viable uh, solution. Uh, and so next, uh, we were wondering, you know, we have a sample of 3.6 million people. Uh, and we're wondering, is there any heterogeneity, right? Uh, did these reminders work better for any one group or the other? And what we found um, was that reminders work better for uh, men than women, uh, which isn't entirely surprising. Uh, that reminders worked better for uh, individuals that were older, um, which they're more vulnerable, uh, so that makes sense. Uh, it worked better for uh, individuals who uh, had received at least one prior booster, uh, it worked better for individuals who were on Medicare, uh, which in the United States is, uh, you know, government funded uh, insurance for the elderly. So it's really capturing the same effect as uh, the median age. And uh, we didn't see any effect for uh, individuals on Medicaid, which is uh, government funded uh, insurance for uh, low income uh, individuals. Um, and then we didn't see any effect for people with commercial insurance, uh, but we did see an effect for people with unknown insurance, which is a variable that kind of captured uh, if the pharmacy didn't know uh, because you know vaccines were free and so people were booking appointments so they didn't necessarily have information on the individual's insurance um, and uh, uh, individuals who just paid in cash. Uh, so really our uh, key takeaways were that text reminders increase uh, COVID booster vaccinations by about like 20% on average and in our top performer we suggested a plan um, it increased vaccination rates by about 23%. Uh, we found that offering patients, you know, free rides to pharmacies for vaccines 
did not add any additional value um, over and above simple reminders. Uh, and uh, this wasn't just us. Uh, you know, forecasters anticipated that providing free rides uh, would outperform simple reminder messages, uh, but they were wrong. Uh, and you know, as I said earlier, uh, it underlines uh, the need uh, to be you know, conducting uh, field experiments uh, in a robust setting. Um, and they were also, the forecasters, wildly over-optimistic about the performance of all interventions uh, in general. Uh, we also found uh, that our reminders, which only focused on uh, the COVID-19 bivalent booster, also uh, boosted flu vaccinations by about 7%. Uh, so there's some positive spillover effects there. Um, we found uh, the reminders effects were larger for men, Medicare beneficiaries, older adults, those with prior boosters, and those with unknown insurance. Uh, and we found that the top performers uh, were personalized. Uh, the top was a uh, suggested date, time, location matching individuals' last vaccination. Uh, this fall, um, from September to October, we actually conducted a follow-up study to this to kind of dig in on this mechanism about whether or not uh, is it, you know, is the recommendation actually have to be uh, per like truly personalized? Someone's last vaccine, um, you know, matched their last vaccine, or could we just recommend uh, a uh, time and day of the week that was, you know, most popular among patients in general. Uh, we received the data about a week ago, but have not had a chance to actually uh, dig into it. So stay tuned. Um, we also found that communicating infection rates were currently high in a patient's county, uh, you know, added value, as did uh, sending, um, you know, the, the text on behalf of the patient's local pharmacy team. Uh, so... Uh, thank you uh, to our funders, our team scientists, our staff, and our partners, and thank you to all of you.